think about the stories that we do see of people who have been involved in the carceral system and whatnot. The way we, the voyeuristic way in which we engage with that is very much a, you know, at least they're, they're, they're doing well, but not better than me. It's a very pity focused. It's a very undignified way in which we look at people who've been impacted by incarceration. Well, you should just be grateful for this. Like, yes. we, get, we yes. get you, like, and that to me is the essence of why I started my organization because I will not be told, nor will I allow other women to be told what they should be grateful for. Repeat after me. I bring more than diversity. I bring irreplaceable perspectives. Hey friends, my name is Whitney and I'm the host of Impostrix Podcast, the show that validates professionals of color navigating imposter syndrome and racial toxicity in their career. Join us and be validated. You got this. Welcome back to Impostrix Podcast. My name is Whitney Lee and I am here with Gabrielle Perry. I'm Looking forward to this conversation. It's an important one. As you know, if you're a regular listener to Impostrix Podcast, April is Second Chance Month, and it's a time where governments, citizens, entities, whoever, nonprofits, um, really put a lot of focus in helping to navigate reentry for incarcerated people who are coming back into society. And we've got a long, long way to go. But one area that I have a lot of interest in um, because of my work experience is in what it's like for incarcerated people to return to work and to build careers and the impact that incarceration has on systems, on people, on communities, on families, everything from career to housing to health. Um, so our guest today, Gabrielle, is the founder, executive director of the Thurman Perry Foundation. Um, and I'm gonna let her talk all about the work that she does and how, you know, where where she's coming from. And so thank you for joining us, Gabrielle. Please introduce yourself. What identities do you bring to this conversation? Um, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. <laughs> um, my name is Gabrielle Perry. I, again, am founder and executive director of the Thurman Perry Foundation. I'm also a 31-year-old epidemiologist hailing from the great state of Louisiana. At least we try to be. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, my organization, the Thurman Perry Foundation, is named in memory of my deceased father. Um, but we solely serve women and girls impacted by incarceration. We are an award-winning Louisiana-based nonprofit uh, operating nationally solely in service to those women and girls. Um, we have a three-tier programming at the Thurman Perry Foundation, starting with the Perry Second Chances Scholarship, which essentially was born from me giving money out on Twitter on my savings account um, <laughs> to a full-fledged scholarship program um, awarding scholarships to currently incarcerated women, formerly incarcerated women, and the daughters of anyone who has ever been incarcerated, uh, as long as they are enrolled in a two to four year college university or vocational school. Um, as of the end of next month, because uh, we extended applications this year, as of the end of next month, we will have awarded $100,000 scholarships in three and a half years. So I'm very, very excited. Um, we also have um, the bread and butter of my organization, um, which is called Girl Code. Um, Girl Code was born from my birth mother's experiences while she was incarcerated. Um, we essentially are the only organization in this country donating organic menstrual products to incarcerated women and girls um, in multiple states. So we operate in Louisiana, in Texas, and we just expanded to the state of New York. So we are very, very excited. Um, we have since in since September of 2021, we've donated over 206,000 organic menstrual products, um, which is a feat because I have no staff. I have no physical location. I handle everything digitally or automated wise or via email. Um, it's just me and my board um, made up of women just like myself who are formerly incarcerated or have been impacted by incarceration in some way. Um, and 
we're just trying to meet the need in a tangible way. It's also led us to our third program, um, which we are currently fundraising for now. We are $4,500 shy of our goal, um, but it's called um, Mother's Day 365. Uh, for about a year after I was arrested, I was homeless, um, as is such the case with women across this country. It's women and girls who are the fastest growing group of incarcerated people in this country. And we're also um, more likely to be homeless than formerly incarcerated men. Um, and so Mother's Day 365 is about paying the rent and mortgages of formerly incarcerated pregnant women and mothers to ensure that they can have and maintain safe housing uh, after their arrest. Because, you know, if... I, I just am not of the belief that once incarceration ends, the punishment to, should continue. That's just not what this system is supposed to be about. Right. Yeah. I love everything about this. So I've shared with you, I've shared with <laughs> listeners, that you know my experience is not that of an, a formerly incarcerated person. My experience is as an attorney who go went in and out of jails and prisons, seeing women and men, um, and then leaving. And um, working with people on, you know, whatever their civil rights issue was on parole and on reentry. And it is mind boggling just how many barriers there are mm -hmm. to like once you enter the criminal legal system, whether it's an arrest or whether it's a citation and like a civil fine or fee, whether it's community service at, at the point of entering the criminal legal system, everything just piles on. And in my experience working with folks, more often than not, people do not have that support. And so when I hear you talking about the programs that you all offer, um, everything from feminine hygiene products, which come to Georgia, because there are four women's prisons in Georgia, and out of all of these prisons, it was so regular to hear stories in the jails of women having no access to feminine hygiene products, zero. And using clothing, using their clothing and then having to wash their clothing um, in their sink and hope that it dries and then wrap it around themselves again the next day. You talk a lot about dignity as far as one of your main values. And it's awful to begin to imagine the loss of dignity that women have when they can't even access basic feminine hygiene products. But the other thing that I find I'm just so excited about is the Mothers 365. As a housing attorney, it's been nearly impossible to get people into safe and affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it is a matter of $500, $1,000 um, for a security deposit, which is going to be a larger security deposit than anybody else's security deposit because you have had criminal um, involvement with the criminal legal system. So hearing about the work that you do brings me a lot of hope for people who will be impacted by your services. Thank you. That means so mm -hmm. much. I think that um, I say this all the time. I feel like anybody who knows me is watching this would probably get tired of hearing it or roll their eyes. But I always say that there is no national narrative surrounding women's incarceration, because when we think of incarceration in the U.S., we think of a man. And the only time we really engage with incarceration in terms of women is in twofold, either we are in, engaging in the voyeurism that is true crime. So a woman has been a victim of a crime or she has been charged with a crime in um, a sensational way, in a way that is also in tandem with a man. So we are just kind of obsessed with those types of stories. We never hear about what the reality is for incarceration with women. We just kind of deal with the extremes or we deal solely with women who are victims of crimes. But the reality is that the majority of women who are incarcerated are victims of crimes. So it's a, definitely a victim and perpetrator um, duality. And that's where a lot of women get lost in, caught in the crossfire in terms of resources being applied to them because you cannot 
not address a problem, one, that you don't know is there, and two, that you actually have no empathy for. It's so difficult for women to be able to access any resources before, during, or after incarceration, because if we even remember them at all, they are still stuck with the the mantle of of being immoral, because regardless of the fact that one in three Americans has a criminal record in this country, um, we still associate incarceration with, or even just in any kind of introduction with the criminal legal system with a, a moral failing, like you are somehow an inherently bad person and you need to turn from your ways and anything that you endure as a result of your incarceration is ultimately at its foundation, your own doing and your own fault. And that spits in the face of everything we as Americans are enduring with our incredibly poverty-based um, society, like how we are forced to survive with roughly no safety net and strict, strict provisions on the few ones that we do have. Um, and so there are women, like there are women just sitting in the middle of all of that. And so you find that we also tend to believe that the law in and of itself is gender blind, like it's somehow immune from the societal biases that everything else operates under, which is absolutely insane. Like there is, I mean, going back to menstrual products. So when we first started this, I remember, um, going to the sheriff's department near me um, locally and with one of my college professors from Tulane and having a meeting and just being like, hey, I really want to make sure that these women have quality products. I came to the to the cops from a very epidemiological standpoint mm -hmm. because the average woman just in, in the general population is going to use from 12 to 16,000 menstrual products throughout her menstruating life. And so with there being relatively no control over like what's being put into these products and whatnot. And I just wanted to make sure that these women had something, especially because products that you find in jails and prisons are not the same as what you'd see at like a, the feminine hygiene aisle at Target or something like that. They are not no. dealing with that. And so even then you may find that these women are being given like one or two tampons if the facility allows tampons, because many, many facilities you will find consider tampons to be a security risk. Right. So they will only allow menstrual pads, which is what we donate. Um, if you if they are given any at all, they'll be given like two per month. Um, they have to pay for the rest. The majority of women who are incarcerated in this country were extremely incarcerated prior to coming, I mean, extremely impoverished prior mm -hmm. to being incarcerated. So it's only leading to worse when they are incarcerated. And so you have the different states paying these women or not paying them at all because certain states like Texas do not pay incarcerated women for their absolutely free labor. Um, you have states like my state, let's use Louisiana, for example, an incarcerated woman will make anywhere from four cents to 40 cents per hour. If you get a super cushy work study job, you might get a dollar an hour, maybe. And that's if you're like working at like the governor's mansion or something like that. Like that is, which typically they reserve work study jobs for the men because, and you want to know why? Why? Because they are con there are concerns about the female trustees becoming pregnant, which essentially eliminates you from consideration just by being a woman, just by your own right. biology. And so just because they are making so little, the cost for these things, which are provided by outside vendors, things like menstrual products, things like a pencil and paper and whatnot are astronomical. We were told by uh, our very first um, currently incarcerated winner when we first started the program, she was saying, you know, it'll cost me like 13 bucks for a box of tampons. And but it'll take me like. 150 hours just to work for it, like up to, depending on like what's available to me and what I'm able to do. And that's just for like maybe a box of like 20 tampons. These women are definitely improvising. One of my former board members, uh, her name is Kimberly Haven. She's a national name in terms of advocating for menstrual equity for incarcerated women. Um, she spoke about like 
her own experience having to have an emergency hysterectomy um, due to using menstrual products past their viability because this is a health risk. It can cause toxic shock syndrome. It can be fatal to these women who are only trying to survive. You have these corrections officers because, again, the majority of corrections officers in women's facilities are men. Mm -hmm. And you're having these corrections officers coerce these women into sexual acts and sexual violence in exchange for or menstrual products so that they can just try to menstruate with dignity. And even then, being able to move in and out, not just in prisons, but the jails, being able to move in and out of the prisons and jails just to visit your lawyer, having to you know squat and cough and then go back out and then go back in, like just being having the freedom of a movement while you menstruate is compromised because if you're only given two tampons per month, but I got to go see my lawyer in visitation and oh, my mom's here just to, you know, let me see my baby. Like, okay, well, that's my that's two, two tampons per month. That's my two and I'm done yeah. and I can't have anything else. And so these women are using socks. They are cutting up their clothes and inserting them inside themselves. They are uh, using mattress stuffing um, by opening up their prison issued mattresses. And what people don't often realize is that in some states, because if these women choose to not do anything at all, let's just say you try to free bleed it and you don't want to engage in any kind of um, alternative methods, that is destruction of prison property. And that can mm -hmm. lead to time upon your sentence because you are free bleeding onto your prison issue clothes. Mm -hmm. So it's really a no win situation. It is inhumane and it is part of just the growing epidemic of incarceration for women in this country. Yeah. It's you brought, you talked about commissary, you talked about the, the cost of products um, in relation to, the amount of money that people are able to make if they are working in jails and prisons, and um, this is classic racial capitalism. This is classic Thirteenth Amendment allowed slavery. Um, and when we think about at the access that people have to any product, to food, um, in jails and prisons, it is important to think about that the cost is not being subsidized. The cost yeah. of whatever it is that people need or people want is not being subsidized by the fact that they're making pennies. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of people, you know, it just, it strikes me the poverty that most people are in when they're living in a jail or a prison. Uh, and then the poverty, of course, that they're going to face as they, um, move into back into society. And so, you know, money is so important here. And I think that's something that we don't talk explicitly about we don't, is money. We don't. Um, and especially when we're dealing with incarcerated people because they quote, did something wrong, they deserve this punishment. And so everything that happens inside the jail and prison is their punishment when in fact that's actually not the case. That's not the purpose of jail and prison. I don't even want to get caught in, I love that you brought up money because I don't even want to get caught up in the belief that money and the carceral system kind of in their relationship as like once you leave the insides of those prisons and jails, because that's not true. It's an entire process. Mm -hmm. I've been researching this so much for my upcoming book. Like it's really and truly a process that starts before you ever get inside the jail. And I think that people need to really familiarize themselves with the concept of carceral debt. The reason that so many people have a criminal record is not because we as Americans are just morally depraved people. That's not what it is. This is a system that needs us to survive. It needs fodder. And so when you have people, let's say, you know, you are arrested on like just a very minor misdemeanor. Okay. Well, from that point, like, 
if you get past the site, it's like let's, let's let's say you're not issued a citation, but even then, that is also money you have to pay to the system. You have to feed the beast. Okay, if you're arrested for a minor misdemeanor, you have to pay court fees. You have to pay court costs. You have to secure a lawyer. Even there is even a fee to pay public defenders, depending on which state. There's still a minor fee you have to pay that is not free. You have to pay the cost to gas up your car to get there, to pay for parking at the courthouse. Like all these things have to pay. And then let's say once the case is um, is even dismissed and whatnot. Let's say it's dismissed. You have to pay to in order to be able to get your record expunged. Because what a lot of people don't realize is that regardless of whether it's a guilty or not guilty verdict, that arrest is still in your record, and that is going to impact. Unless you get that expunged, that's going to impact every job you have everywhere you live for the rest of your life. Juveniles are not ex uh, exempt from that either. Those records are not sealed depending on what state you are in. Right. And so that can change the trajectory of your life. Let's say you, um, you, you know, your case is a bit more serious and whatnot. You are incarcerated for a certain period of time. You are paying, uh, incarcerated people pay, pay health insurance co-pays. Mm -hmm. They pay for tuition if they have access to uh, education. Mm -hmm. They have to pay for food. They have to pay for medicine. They have to pay pay to see a doctor like they, all these things have to be paid they have to be secured by these people nothing is free there is nothing free inside of when you are incarcerated nothing nothing right. and if you and can't so, pay it then you leave with debt and if you can't pay it you will leave with that debt even when your sentence is over and that is truly at least for me and my experience that was when the punishment truly started for me mm -hmm. because I was like, I could pay the court fees. I could pay the court costs and whatnot. It was trying to find a job, which I love um, this um, prison policy. It's a, it's a nonprofit think tank that does a mm -hmm. ton of research on incarceration. They did an uh, uh, article about how a lot of uh, corporations that purport to be supportive of hiring people with criminal records and whatnot, they're doing the follow-up trends on that now, and that is not at all true. I applied at Sherwin-Williams. They told me to my face that because I had an arrest on my record that I, I would not be able to be hired. I remember like, just not being able to secure safe housing. Um, I was living in like this little shack, um, which I think somebody has bought and really fixed up <laughs> in the 10 years since this all happened. Um, but I just like, I just didn't have, I was so by myself. I didn't have anything. I didn't have anybody. And I was racking up all this debt because mm -hmm. you have to pay restitution. You have to pay for the classes that are often um, recommended, even if for a misdemeanor charge, which is what I ended up settling for. Um, you have to pay for court mandated classes. You have to pay your probation officer. You have, these people have to be paid and you're the one who has to pay them. And a lot of people don't realize like, you know, the government is using private vendors for the majority. Mm. Real under, there's a real misunderstanding that people think that you're paying the government or that all this is just handled by one entity. No, there are multiple entities that work within the carceral system to profit off of people's suffering. And so you will take those debts with you forever. They will impact your credit. And because you have that criminal record, you cannot sustain gainful employment to be able to um, get your record expunged, to be able to get an actual gainfully employed job to pay these debts back. And so then what happens that cycle of poverty continues to a boiling point until it can't anymore and then we enter recidivism territory okay. because hungry people are not hungry for long especially for women women like the majority of women who are incarcerated up to like 75 percent or so are mothers they have children to feed when we incarcerate women we incarcerate entire communities 98 percent of these women are going to be out eventually they're going to come back out. Then these children have to be taken care of. They have to be taken care of. And so what do you expect people to do? What do you expect them to do when you saddle them with all this debt? I remember when my birth mother um, was actually released on compassionate release because she, my story with my birth mother is so really the set, of, set the course of my entire life. My birth mother actually gave me away to total strangers um, the day that I was born to try to save me from her fate of being incarcerated or being impacted by the decisions that she made as an adult. Um, and so um, while she was incarcerated, she um, was experiencing severe, severe abdominal pain as the story was told to me many, 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 many years. And so 
she suffered through that. And what they kept telling her was menstrual cramps ended up being stage four metastatic colon cancer. And so when they sent her home on compassionate release, it was right before, um, it was about nine to 10 months before she actually passed away. And so when she did pass away, we of course sued for, for myself and my siblings for um, her negligent death and a wrongful death lawsuit ensued. And even when we settled, the first people who had to be paid back were Medicaid for her unpaid doctor bills. Yeah. And so it truly, truly, truly opened my eyes to what this system is and how it eats people alive. And I think that's, that's it. You know, so many people, um, yourself included, as I understand it, inter interact or are become involved in the criminal legal system because of, quote, these crimes of poverty. So mm -hmm. these actions that we take um, because we don't have money. Uh, when I left Seattle 10 years ago, they were criminalizing sleeping on park benches, mm -hmm. um, petty theft urinating in public, these types of, of um, what society has deemed to be crimes mm -hmm. that people may commit out of necessity. And mm -hmm. the thought of a multi-billion dollar industry of the incarceration, the prison industrial complex, profiting off of the traps that are set at essentially every step of the way as you're navigating this system is um, disgusting. And, and just what you spoke about is um, really enlightening. I wonder if you'll share with us about um, your experience, not only, I mean, if you want, you can share what you were arrested for, but really what I wanna know is what your re-entry and what your, I guess, um, process to become stable, um, both financially, uh, but also with housing and with relationships in your life, if you if if those were impacted, I'm really um, interested to learn about that. And then, of course, with your work, because you are now an epidemiologist. <laughs> uh, my story is so complicated when I when I, I, I it makes sense to me, but I feel like when I tell people the story, like they they get a bit confused. Um, so I mentioned siblings earlier. I was actually raised um, an only child from my parents. My um, essentially let me start from the beginning, I guess. So um, my birth mother, I was the fifth and final kid of hers, she had um, my three brothers and my oldest sister, these are my biological siblings, my biological mother. Um, but I was the only one to grow up not knowing I was adopted, not knowing her, not knowing any of them. I like to believe that by the time that I came along or she found out she was pregnant with me, that she knew something had to change. Um, and so I was supposed to go to her best friend who was already raising um, one of my brothers at the time. There was just no room for me. And so she ended up giving me to the co-worker of one of her best friends, um, who is my mother and wow. the only mother I've ever truly known. Um, and from that day forward, you know, I had a family, but my parents were much older when I was born. Uh, so I had older parents and I kind of came into this world as a caretaker, especially when I was about nine or 10. My, my adopted mother was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. She had to literally relearn how to walk. I spent a lot of my childhood taking care of her, bathing her, feeding her, clothing her and whatnot. She's great now. Like she's fine. I see the look on your face. She's up what? street wow okay bye. <laughs> You're okay yeah, i'm all like oh no somebody else died no <laughs> no 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 well i will say so i but as soon as my mom was able to like get through physical therapy at least get on crutches and and drive again and we had a little bit of a brief reprieve from what this had been my dad got diagnosed with cancer with head and neck cancer and so i think within like six seven months of diagnosis, um, he was gone. And so I spent 
spent, he died when I was 15. I spent all that time um, taking care of him, me and my mom trying to just work it out. And so I was a sophomore in, um, in high school. I was just shy. He died like two months shy of my 16th birthday. And so I'm trying to navigate finishing school. I'm trying to navigate taking care of my mom. I'm working two jobs in high school. I'm doing everything we can because with my dad's death came the loss of a, of a big source of income. Right. Um, and so literally just duct taping everything that I can together as long as possible. I ended up getting a scholarship to LSU and was able to go to Baton Rouge, which I was very excited about. Um, but I still had my mom to think about who was three hours away in Alexandria. And so I'm paying kids to, uh, with my little bitty internship money, I'm paying kids to like drive me back to my hometown um, so I can help take care. I had neighbors taking care of her. We were, I grew up in a very, very close knit neighborhood. So I had neighbors checking in on her and helping her and getting her groceries and whatnot and just trying to like do what I could. And it was, and it, it, it felt impossible. It really did. And I wasn't talking to anyone about it. And so I ended up um, taking money from my work study job in order to just try to sustain both she and I. And I think after a few months I got caught, I confessed immediately. Like it just wasn't something I was gonna hide from. Um, I was arrested and I spent literally a full day in jail. And I always tell people, like there's this hierarchy in criminal justice reform when we tell these stories where if you didn't do 20 years standing on your head, then you're, you got to go to the back of the room. Like your pain doesn't count. But I feel like those are the anomalies. Mm -hmm. I am the majority. I am the everyday person. And there's a book coming out um, called, um, I think it's called A Day Is Unto A Thousand Years, something like that. And it talks about how, one day in the criminal justice system, one day in jail can destroy your life. Because I had lost my job. I had had this very public criminal record and whatnot because the media and, and the carceral system work in tandem. They are also mm -hmm. partners. And so it made it, even though I was innocent until proven guilty, it made it in, impossible to navigate that situation. And so that fed into me being homeless, despite the fact that I had a very kind, extremely compassionate judge on my case. He was a lovely man. He and I actually did um, an interview together for CBS Morning News with Gail King about my story. Um, very lovely man who literally told the cameras, he was like, I just was not gonna ruin this girl's life. Like I just was not gonna do that. Um, and he saw that my crime was about survival. Like he right. saw that I, I had meant no ill will. I paid every cent back and worked my butt off to do so. I was doing my court mandated classes and I had to keep working because I was like paying all this stuff off. And, and so I ended up working at Cane's, Raising Cane's and at a, a, I forget the name of the restaurant, but they were like within walking distance of each other. And so I would end one shift at the restaurant during the day and then work at Cane's till three in the morning. So I really was like working my butt off. Wow. And what I loved about working for Raising Cane's is that that's kind of where, cause I, it's mostly kids that work there with kids my age. And I had been surrounded like by really nobody except like the, the, the immensity of my own thoughts mm -hmm. and the, and like my own suffering. And so kind of working at Cane's put me back around people my age and made me feel like a person again. And I got to see, like, I got to make friends and I got to see people like my age doing age appropriate things. And you cannot be what you cannot see. So it sort of breathed a lot of life back into me. And so that kind of started the journey of me thinking, okay, what is next? Like, what do I need to be doing? What can I do? I need to go back to school. I need to finish my degree to take care of like everything. At the time, my mom, um, I, had, I called my aunt and uncle. They stepped in, thank God. Um, and they took my mom in um, to, to help take care of her. Um, well, I got myself together and so, um, I ended up um, 
leaving one of my jobs and going to um, to ask one of the professors at Southern University if I could be an intern in his cancer research lab. Um, and he said, yes, he's a lovely man. Um, and so I worked for him for about 11 months. And I, I, did, I never told him what was happening. I think he just assumed that I was like a student from a different school. Like he, did, he didn't know, I think, until he knew. Like, mm-hmm. and he never treated me any differently. I think he wow. knew, because I was taking about three or four, really like three, maybe four buses, depending on what was happening. And like, I just felt like, okay, if I'm gonna go back to school, I need to have something like that says I'm serious about this. Because I had been on probation for a year uh, and I still had to check in with the courts. And so I was doing my community service, which they also mandated. But I felt like, OK, if I have this, it shows that I'm ready to get back to normal. And so I worked for Dr. Gray for uh, 11 or so months. And I ended up applying to go back to school. I wanted to start slow. I started at community college, got my associate's degree. I went, then I applied to go back to the full university to finish my um, degree in biological sciences. Um, And then I felt like once I finished my undergrad degree, like like we're all systems go now. Like I just felt like I can do this. And so that was also around the time that I started getting more comfortable telling my story. Because one thing about being incarcerated and being a formerly incarcerated person, it's a box that you can never come out of. Like you can never go back into once you come out of it. It's why a lot of people don't talk about it. Like you would never Mm -hmm. guess one in three people in this country are estimated to have a criminal record. And so because people don't talk about it. We associate it as a terrible thing, a moral failing. We wonder what you did and why you did it. And we don't want to be associated with that. And you're a Um, bad person. And you're a bad person. Yeah. And at that point in time, I felt like I'll be whatever anybody wants me to be. I don't care. Like, I, I'm, I'm fine with this. And so I remember my um, my personal statement for the epidemiological program at Tulane University School of Public Tropical Medicine, side of them, um, <laughs> talked about, like, me being in jail and like the first sentence, like, do you know what I remember most about being in jail? And it's how kind everyone was. Like the women were so kind to me. I remember being very, mostly in shock about everything around me. I wasn't really reacting to a ton of things, but I I remember once I found out that I was on the news, I started hyperventilating in the holding Mm -hmm. cell, in the pink holding cell in East Baton Rouge Parish prison. And one of the women, she was like a Latino woman, and she was like, girl, it's going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, girl, like, it's fine. Everything's cool. He wants some water. Like, <laughs> 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 and I was like, and like one of the, one of the deputies, one of the female deputies came over and she was like, girl. <laughs> but it's a big deal. I was like, I am 20 years old. Like, I'm trying to figure it out, please. <laughs> And everybody was just like, they were very patient with me, but they were mostly just like, girl, like, it's going to be okay. (laughs) (laughs) And they laughed with me and they joked with me. Once I I had been in the holding cell for so long that after a certain time, they processed everybody to the back. So I ended up going to the back and I remember, oh my God, now I'm getting emotional. (laughs) I remember this girl who um, couldn't have been more than probably like three or four years older than me. And she was so beautiful. Like, you ever just meet people who are just, like, ethereally beautiful? Like, you can't stop staring. Yes. She was a beautiful girl. And um, she had, it, I could tell she had been there for a while. She shared, like, a little bit of what um, she was there for because her and her sister were there. And her boyfriend was on the men's side because the prison is co-ed. And um, she just, like walked over to me and started talking to me. And she was so nice. It was as if we were just meeting for lunch. And this was like 11 o'clock at night in the parish prison. <laughs> and she shared um, some snacks with me because I had not really eaten all day. Mm-hmm. I had been in holding all day. They arrested me very, very early in the morning um, and transferred me to the prison. And so um, I hadn't really eaten and they were running low on inventory. So she gave me, um, she gave me a blanket and she said, I'm going to come back and check on you, okay? And she did. She would come and check on me like every about 20 minutes or so periodically. And she yeah. would just like go and talk to everybody. I could tell she had been there for a while because she knew everyone's name. So she had been yeah. there for a while. And 
she, I, I, I remember when they called me, I think I got bailed out at like four in the morning or something like that. I, it's, this is 10 years ago. So it was like maybe three, four in the morning, something like that. I don't know. Um, they called my name, like some, some uh, a female officer walked in and just called my name and said that I was being bailed out. And I remember the first thing I did was like, turn my head looking for that girl. And she looked at me and we just like ran up to each other and hugged each other. And I know that sounds crazy, but like, she and she kissed me on my cheek and she said, you're gonna be okay. Um, and she and she rubbed on my back and then I left. And I would truly give anything to like be able to see her again. I don't remember her name, but I, I see her face so clearly in my mind. Her and her sister were there um, for um, drug charges, I later learned, because it was in the paper. But um, just that kindness of her and all the women around me, like everyone laughing and being so kind of like no one was, I, I think there was just a lot of camaraderie in that moment. And I just did not feel like I was a bad person. Like everyone was treating me. I just felt like a person yeah. with them. And so I really appreciated that. And there were times when I was trying to rebuild my life where I would think about those women because I just was tired of being treated subhuman for having a criminal record. And I missed the only people who treated me like a person. Um, but anyway, I, when I finished undergrad, it was time to go to grad school and I wrote about those women and I wrote about that day and I wrote about what I wanted to do. And I, I got to grad school and I soared. I loved grad school. I loved being <laughs> Epidemiologist. I still love being an epidemiologist. Um, in fact, they awarded me, I want to say, was it last year? It was last April. They gave me an award. Um, they, uh, they created an award for me, apparently. It was um, the, the Graduate of the Last Decade Award, which was intense. Wow. So was like, <laughs> Of the <laughs> last decade? Of the last decade. Like, of like the baddest to do it in this whole decade. I was like, okay. Right. <laughs> and they created it for you? Like, we have got to figure out how to get <laughs> Gabrielle an award. We're going to make up some, and it's going to be badass, and we're going to give it to her. I think it came from that same professor, though, that I had called upon to help me. Because by the time I had gotten my life back together and whatnot, I was having a lot of survivor's guilt. Like 2019 was a wild year because I was so happy to finish my epidemiological degree and be starting my career and whatnot. But I had a ton of survivor's guilt. I really did because I felt like, okay, that was also the year that we settled. We settled my birth mother's wrongful death lawsuit with the Texas Bureau of Prisons two months before I graduated. Right. And so if that, and almost like that was like a 10 years and a month from when she died. And so if that had not happened when it did, I wouldn't even have my job currently because of the background checks required for me to do what I do. And so it, everything came out so perfectly aligned. So it was the settlement of the lawsuit, the distribution of funds, the application for the expungement of my record, which cost me $3,000 wow. and then graduation. And then I think by the time I got to like July, um, like maybe, maybe I don't even, I can't even say when, but I know, I think it was around July was when I got the notification that no one opposed my uh, record being expunged and I was free to start my, my career now. And so I think after Labor Day is when I started my career and I'm still there today <laughs> and getting ready to be promoted. I'm very um, excited. Well, it's exciting. So congratulations <laughs> on the about to be promotion. Think about the stories that we do see of people who have been involved in the carceral system and whatnot. The way we, the voyeuristic way in which we engage with that is very much a, you know, at least they're, they're, they're doing well, but not better than me. It's a very pity focused. It's a very undignified way in which we look at people who've been impacted by incarceration. Well, you should just be grateful for this. Like yes, we get, we yes. get your, like, and that to me is the essence of why I started my organization because I will not be told, nor will I allow other women to be told what they should be grateful for. I endured a lot of that where it was as if who was I 
to want to be an epidemiologist. Someone actually told me they don't let people like me become epidemiologists. And I remember um, when I started being very open about being formerly incarcerated and whatnot, I had a boss uh, who was a man. And I remember he would just try, like he would try me in little ways, like as if I should just be grateful to have this job. And I remember he ended up getting fired for some very unsavory things. Um, but I remember thinking to myself, am I going to have to make the choice between hiding the things that I have been through for the comfort of others and, and the safety of myself, honestly, or am I going to allow all the different parts of myself, the formerly incarcerated part, the scientist part, like, am I going to like allow every single part of myself in any room that I am in. And I made that choice and I do not regret it. Wow. So that, that was how we did it. That's how we got to today. <laughs> yeah. One of the things, so it's so important for me to learn more about the experiences of formerly incarcerated people as they're entering, re-entering the workforce. Um, but also to share this part of life with listeners who maybe have no interaction with the criminal legal system and who do believe that people who are in jails and prisons deserve to be there. I like to think that nobody listening to the show believes that, but maybe they believe it. And I think for me, my last job was the first job that I worked at um, that hired people with criminal backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I think it's a bit of an anomaly, um, particularly in the legal field, because, well, because of all sorts of reasons. Um, and yet, as great as that is, and I, I'm saying this because I want people listening to the show to be thinking about how we engage with people who are formerly incarcerated, um, because exactly what you're saying, it's very much so this air of, well, if you're here, then you're here because you're lucky and you should be grateful. And don't, mm -hmm. don't speak up too much, don't talk too much, don't create too many waves because at the end of the day, you're just somebody that used to be in prison or used to be in jail and like you're a bad person, so. And that's disgusting to me. Like when I'm confronted with that, it's really disgusting to me. I was not raised and I, I, I can say this for a fact. I The reason my organization is named in memory of my father is because not only did he save my life and not only did he teach me that in no way, shape, form or fashion am I ever less than a man or that women are less than men, but I was raised around formerly incarcerated men. My parents had a lawn service. It was called Jules Lawn Service. Um, and so um, the only people they hired were the men from the prison work release program in our parish. And once they were actually released, once they were freed, they still had a job with my dad. Mm. And they worked for him for years, all those same men. In fact, I'm still in contact with two of them today because they were brothers. We still talk on Facebook. I think I'm trying to convince one of them to have their daughter um, apply for our scholarship program. Mm -hmm. um, but I never felt unsafe. My dad would leave me alone around these men and whatnot. Like my mom would too, my very, very strict parents, because it just wasn't like these people have, we've already done like the background checks and whatnot. Like these people are just people and they need jobs and they worked hard. Like the idea that these people are just like morally depraved is so ubiquitous in society absolutely makes me sick. Especially when we're talking about women because I, I touched on it earlier where there's this belief that the law is gender blind and that is absolutely not true. There are so many nuances between incarceration for women and incarceration for men. And if we're just focusing on women, the majority of women who are incarcerated in jails because remember, jail and prison, not the same thing. I know you right. know that. The majority of women who are incarcerated in jails are legally innocent. They have not been convicted of a crime. 
So if this is innocent until proven guilty, then those women are just literally sitting in jail for no reason. If we're talking about women who are incarcerated in prisons, the majority of women who are incarcerated in prisons are there for two different types of crimes. And that is property crimes and, um, subs and crimes related to substance use disorder. So if we're talking about nonviolent crime, because since that tends to be the cudgel that people want to, to, to land upon, that that is the furthest people can go in terms of, of the moral barriers of incarceration. You are still fine with those people being punished for the rest of their lives. You are still fine with the enduring trauma, though you recognize the fact that they did this to survive. And then you have to talk about the gender bias in sentencing. I mean, we're talking about, like, and, and the first thing the incels online will say <laughs> is that, <laughs> well, there are more men in jail, so so um, um, incarceration affects them more, and, and men get women get easier sentencing and things of that nature. No, the best example of that is when our sentences are harsher because we violate those gender norms. For example, mm -hmm. women who are convicted of murder, manslaughter, things of that nature, which is a rarity for women they tend to get harsher sentences than men do. This is because often when a woman, most often when a woman kills, it is out of self-defense. She has typically been um, like in an abusive relationship. You could have all the domestic violence evidence in the world. You could have everybody walk up and speak in defense of you, but it doesn't matter because you were in a relationship with him and you should have known better. And we don't do that with men because when men kill their female partners, that is statistically most often seen as a crime of passion. So we see those men with manslaughter sentences, with, with suspended sentences, sometimes depending on what it looks like. We see that leniency and that discrepancy between the sexes when we're talking about these sentences. We also see it when it plays out in uh, family related crimes and whatnot. Failure to protect laws are almost exclusively applied to women because, yes, he was beating the living hell out of you and the and the child in question and whatnot. But where were you? Where right. were you after number two? What were you doing? And yeah, we don't care that you went to the shelter. We don't care about any of that. But you should have did eat 10 times more than what you already did. And we're going to sentence you as an equal co-conspirator, co-conspirator laws to conspiracy laws and whatnot. Find women who weren't even present for the crime being given equal sentences to the male perpetrator. So gender bias in sentencing depends on the crime, because when we as women step outside of the gender norms that society has assigned to us, we are immediately punished for it by the carceral system. Yeah, I talk a lot about complicity. Um, and specifically complicity in, in racism. Um, and it's this, you know, this realization that when we're not doing things, when we're, our, our inaction is, in, is action. But when we're talking about the criminal legal system and we're talking about the impact that it has on women and on communities, I think it really is um, necessary that we say enough is enough like what you said that this does have to stop and that yes it's a huge problem um you know it's not an easy feat but things like giving feminine hygiene products so that women in jails and prisons can menstruate with dignity as you said um you know donating to causes like yours that mm -hmm. provide financial assistance and then like having conversations in the community because again, so many of us just trust that someone is involved in this legal system because that's where they belong, because mm -hmm. they did something. And we don't think about how the punishment continues for life. Mm -hmm. And we don't think about that that's not the point. Mm -hmm. And we can start questioning this. We can start questioning this to our families when we're watching the news and something happens in the news and somebody makes some snide remark. We can talk about this in our workspaces when somebody that we're working with is using language like inmate, that is dehumanizing. And don't be afraid to turn the vibe way down when people are getting ridiculous. Because one thing I, it hasn't happened recently, but what I, I think is because 
anybody who encounters me knows I've done the research. Like I've done, I'm writing a whole book. Like we, we, we talk to these women. I am constantly at the prison every single month. Like we do this work. So it's very rare that I find people who um, are just outright, like that's not real. Like that's not happening. <laughs> And I say that because in the very beginning, I remember being told to my face that my work was distracting from the men and that that was a more pressing issue Mm -hmm. and it was a distraction within the movement for black lives to even like that women needed to wait their turn. Um, And I just remember being like, you know what, if y'all do this myself, like I'm good. (laughs) And I think. But if you're gonna do it, if you're gonna do this kind of work, you need to be learned. I am not one of those people who are like, if, if I don't know, I just don't believe that imperfect activism is, a, is like a mortal sin. I think that none of us are always gonna get it right. I don't believe that. But just to find people who care about this and who are willing to expend energy and resources to it, you can change the world with that kind of person. All, you get two or three or four of those people together, sky's the absolute limit. You can change, you can change laws. You can change like communities with just three or four people with like imperfect activism. Yeah. I think that we're all human, and I think that expending energy to a cause, no matter how imperfect it is, like is still energy well spent. So I think that my best advice would be to get creative. Wow, thank you. Okay, so if we want to donate, where, or, or I guess otherwise, just if we wanted to follow you, but really we should be thinking about donating. <laughs> so if we wanted to donate, where should we, how do we do that? Uh, if you would like to donate, preferably before April the 20th, because we're $4,500 away. But once we reach this $4,500, we will have enough money to pay the rent or mortgages of two formerly incarcerated pregnant women and moms uh, every month for a one full calendar year. So we are very, very excited. Um, we are raising money for um, our, via, via our event, um, Mother's Day 365, a jazz luncheon and fundraiser honoring system impacted moms. So if you're in the area, if you want to get on a plane in New Orleans at the Ace Hotel, um, tickets are on our website. You can find us at thurmanperryfoundation.org. Um, um, that is T-H-U-R-M-A-N-P-E-R-R-Y foundation.org uh, and if you'd like to purchase a ticket or see more about our event um, find us at Instagram Thurman Perry Foundation find us on Twitter um, Thurman Perry FDN um, be wary of me on Twitter I'm always yelling <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like that's the appropriate use of uh, Twitter for a black woman just saying I feel like that's the only way I can get people to hear me is what I'm yelling so <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I think in, any support at all, even if it's a dollar, it absolutely helps. Um, and so, yeah, just keep, oh, and make sure you follow our newsletter. The first thing is going to prompt you when you go to our website is to follow our newsletter so you can keep up with what we have going on, keep up with our girls. We have, like, the success stories of the organization are really the thing that make me the happiest. There's, wow. and I, it's the greatest honor of my life to be able to pay for the educations of these girls and have them not once doubt their abilities, that they can do whatever it is that they want to do, that they can have whatever it is that they want to have. They are not stuck in the worst moment of their lives. And so that's what all this money goes towards. Like, this is really my purpose. It's, it's, it's what I'm on this earth for. Wow. Thank you so much for joining us, Gabrielle. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. (laughs) Thanks so much for joining me for this conversation. I hope that you got as much out of it as I did. Feel free to continue the conversation with us over on Facebook at the Impostrix Podcast Validating Space. We welcome all and it's a space for us to validate each other as we work through work, race, and imposter syndrome. You can find out more about me or about the podcast at www.impostrixpodcast.com. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Podcast. Until next time, be validated. <laughs>